president's program begins with the Dr. Samuel Allison Cosgrove Memorial Lecture. The lecture entitled, Sex, Ideology, and Religion, How Family Planning Frees Women and Changes the World, is a fitting tribute to Dr. Cosgrove, who advocated tirelessly on behalf of women. Here is your 2013 president, Dr. James Breeden, to introduce this year's Samuel A. Cosgrove Lecturer. It is my great pleasure to present to you our Samuel A. Cosgrove Memorial Lecture, Dr. Malcolm Potts. Dr. Malcolm Potts is a Cambridge-trained obstetrician and research embryologist. Dr. Potts has long been a forceful and effective advocate for universal contraceptive access as essential both for women's health and the health of society. In the 1970s, as the first medical director of the International Planned Parenthood Federation, he pioneered the community-based distribution of contraceptives in Thailand and other countries. The landmark population-based studies of maternal mortality Malcolm initiated as founding board member and president of Family Health International helped launch the worldwide Safe Motherhood Initiative. Also under his leadership, Family Health International became the leading U.S. NGO working on AIDS prevention in Africa in the 1980s. Professor Potts joined the University of California, Berkeley in 1992 and formed the Bixby Center, which focuses on population, family planning, and safe motherhood, especially in Africa. Malcolm has written 300 scientific articles and 11 books. He is a Renaissance thinker, and his books include Queen Victoria's Gene and Ever Since Adam and Eve, The Evolution of Human Sexuality. His latest book is called Sex and War, how biology explains warfare and terrorism and offers a path to a safer world. Dr. Potts has the rare accomplishment of presenting his second Cosgrove Lecture. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Malcolm Potts as he presents Sex, Ideology, and Religion, How Family Planning Frees Women and Changes the World. President and fellows of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, guests, Madam First Lady of Zambia. As a young obstetrician practicing in Britain in the 1960s, I began to ask women, would you like any advice on family planning? They frequently replied, doctor, I was just going to ask you that. Code for, thank you for bringing this up. The hospital specialist to whom I was responsible a kind man with vast clinical experience told me, family planning is something obstetricians do not do. The last 50 years have seen a revolution in our thinking, but there's still a long way to go. I believe that a woman has a right to decide how to use her own body. It is the freedom that separates a slave from a free person. As physicians and obstetricians, we have the power to break the shackles of reproductive slavery. Family planning is a natural and essential part of modern living. It allows societies to become more sustainable, more prosperous, and the world to be a more peaceful place. The joy of family planning is that it inextricable mixture of helping individuals while also an awareness of the multiple ways in which demography has determined our past and will inevitably shape our future. Evolution has superbly adapted us, women, to the number and spacing of pregnancies, but that adaptation was to conditions of a couple of hundred thousand years ago. Until recently, societies in the highland of New Guinea lived literally in the Stone Age. The menarche was at about 18 to 20, the first birth as late as age 25. In those preliterate societies, women were pregnant or breastfeeding for most of their lives. Women could have 50 menstrual cycles or fewer. They averaged five or six children, of whom far, far, half or more died early. Two children surviving to reproduce in the next generation 
was the norm for most of human history. Osama bin Laden, one of 54 children, was a rather unfortunate exception to that norm. The population explosion occurring in the middle of the 20th century was not because women had more children, but thankfully because more children, fewer children died. Most American women now have about two children, usually in about five years. They can have 450 menstrual cycles. Today, women can spend 10 to 15 years struggling to separate sex from pregnancy before the first one to child, and as long afterwards, avoiding another pregnancy after the last wanted birth. We can be proud of the advances made in obstetrics over the past 100 years, but we need to remember that studies show that half the fall in the absolute number of maternal deaths taking place was not due to obstetric care, but because family planning had enabled women to have fewer children and to avoid births at the extremes of fertile life. We can begin reducing the obscene difference in the maternal mortality ratio between rich and poor countries by making family planning widely and universally uh, available. Modern contraception already prevents an estimated 230,000 maternal deaths. Making family planning universally available would save another quarter of a million deaths annually. These are big numbers, but the impact of, on access to family planning on infant lives is even greater. Infants born two years apart have a lower mortality than those born too soon after a prior pregnancy. Globally, with no improvement in medical care, almost three million, three million infant deaths could be prevented if all women used contraception to recreate the 24 to 36 month interval that evolution intended. Sex is a powerful drive and it's been woven into religion and culture for thousands of years. Scientific insights into reproduction go back a little over a century. Mating patterns have evolved in a variety of ways. Many avian species, such as penguins, are monogamous because males can incubate the egg, they can feed the fledglings. Male mammals cannot incubate an egg and men cannot breastfeed a baby. Biologically, women inevitably make much greater investments in time and effort in pregnancy and breastfeeding than men do in making for sperm. Animals that make such an asymmetrical investment in reproduction are sexually dimorphic. The bigger and stronger males compete to control the females. Gorillas are polygamous, chimps, our closest relative, are promiscuous. The males of both species play no role in nurturing the young. During recent human evolution, our big brain babies became even more helpless than a chimpanzee newborn. A novel behavior evolved where the optimum reproductive agenda for the mother was to mate with a man willing to help her. As film star Zaza Gabor quipped, I want a man who's kind, handsome, and understanding. Is that too much to ask of a millionaire? Two behavioral predispositions help switch us towards monogamy. Unlike baboons and other primates, where ovulation is advertised by a visible swelling of the vulva, human ovulation is concealed. We have sex throughout the, men the menstrual cycle. I'm not sure how they did it, but this Danish couple had sex in an MRI machine. Concealed ovulation, frequent sex, and physical closeness are the basis of adult love, and this bond is the cup of the couple is the foundation of parental care. The problem is 
that evolution left men with a choice between two reproductive agendas. Like a chimpanzee, a man can have a, a one-night stand. Actually, in the case of chimps, it's about a 90-second stand because sex is quick. Alternatively, a man can have frequent sex with one woman with a reasonable probability that any baby she delivers will carry his genes. At least in the Stone Age, the child of a woman with a man close by to help was more likely to survive than the baby of a woman abandoned after a brief liaison. But a woman can still have a baby by a man who is not her regular partner, leaving him to think that the child is his own. For men, being cuckold is a costly biological mistake. In short, from an evolutionary perspective, it is to a man's advantage to secure the greatest possible freedom in his own mating, while making sure that any woman he impregnates is faithful to him and unable to exercise choice over her own reproduction. Mix that with a man's greater strength and his drive to secure paternity, and mix that with the woman's interest in deciding the optimum number and spacing of her children, and you have the origin of the double sex, the double standard in sex, and a recipe for domestic violence. Globally, a stunning one in three women is likely to be raped or suffer domestic violence in her lifetime. Fortunately, we are not robots. For example, infants have a remarkable innate facility to learn any language. The language we learn is determined by our culture. Men don't have to be nasty. Love and altruism are also human predispositions. At the same time, it would be naive not to recognize that the male drive to control women's reproduction is ancient and ubiquitous. Patriarchal Stone Age predispositions, in some form or other, seem likely to continue far into the future, perhaps even as long as men have testicles. We have members of Congress who seem to have access to new discoveries in reproductive physiology <laughs> that have somehow escaped publication in refereed journals. In 2009, the Archbishop of Recife, Brazil, a nine-year-old girl was raped repeatedly by her stepfather. She was pregnant with twins. She was given a safe abortion. The Archbishop excommunicated the doctors and the girl's mother, but not, but not the rapist stepfather. Let me circle back to an evolutionary perspective on patterns of childbearing. Modern living has wrought serious adverse changes on the finely tuned, evolved patterns of human reproduction. The recent drop in the age of puberty brings a cascade of social and pathological catastrophes. Young women and young people today are caught between the irresistible drives of sex and the immovable demands of education. Unintended pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections are serious problems. Less visible, but equally important, are lifelong changes in reproductive cancers. One scientific study suggests that modern women have 24 times the risk of ovarian cancer and 240 times the risk of uterine cancer compared with a preliterate society or our Stone Age ancestors. In 1921, an Austrian gynecologist, Ludwig Haberland, described using progesterone as a hormonal contraceptive, suggesting it was an ideal method for the future task of birth control. Tragically, Haberland's prescient vision aroused, aroused such vitriolic opposition that he committed suicide. It took another 30 years before Pincus, Rock, and Chang in Boston developed the first oral contraceptive. And don't forget, at that time, all forms of contraception were illegal in the state of Massachusetts under the 19th century Comstock laws. In the 1960s in England, when I was told obstetricians don't do family planning, 
I went out and did something fairly revolutionary at the time, helping start a family planning clinic for the unmarried. The early high-dose pills we used in those days had many side effects. In the United States, a book called A Doctor's Case Against the Pill compared oral contraceptive manufacturers to Nazis experimenting on prisoners. The pill was almost taken off the market. In 1968, the British Medical Research Council started to recruit 27,000 OC users and 27,000 matched controls. Together with a second British study, we now have 2 million, 2 million women years of observation. Even a relatively brief use of oral contraceptives reduces the risk of uterine, ovarian, and colon rectal cancer and melanomas later in life. OCs neither, re, neither increase nor reduce breast cancer. There's an important reduction in ischemic heart disease. The increase in cervical cancer may reflect a lifestyle difference between users and non-users, or an effect of steroids on the papillomavirus. I hope the next generation of OC users will have access to HPV vaccines. Recent publications underscore the remarkable nature of oral contraceptives. Researchers in the April issue of Contraception found that women with a history of oral contraceptive use have a lower risk of Down syndrome later in baby later in life. Based on data from the Wisconsin Registry for Alzheimer's Prevention, it is suggested that former OC unit users have better cognitive function later in life. Such findings need to be confirmed by additional studies, but they are consistent with an evolutionary framework drawing attention to the significant alteration in patterns of reproduction since the Stone Age. Epidemiology suggests that using oral contraceptives indeed may be more consistent with nature than doing nothing. I'm extremely honored to give the Samuel A. Cosgrove lecture. And to give it twice is like getting a Nobel Prize. Thank you very much to everybody that's invited me here. But I'm particularly excited because only a few months ago, the ACOG Committee on Gynecological Practice made their landmark statement supporting over-the-counter sale of oral contraceptives. This is great. This is good science. It will benefit women. Half of all the pregnancies in the US are unintended. A study quoted by ACOG found 60% of women not currently using contraceptives would be more likely to use them if OCs were available over the counter. OTC distribution makes perfect sense. Family planning is a choice, not a diagnosis by a physician. One dose fits all. OCs are not addictive. No adult or child has ever died from an overdose. Those women who might be better advised using an alternative method, such as women over 35 who smoke, can be clearly informed on the package. Last year, my wife and I attended a meeting in the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Vatican City. The keynote speech, titled The Plight of Nuns, suggested that nuns should take the pill for a couple of years before entering a after entering the convent, because doing so would significantly reduce their lifelong risk of ovarian, uterine, and other health problems. This might seem a tongue-in-cheek attack on the Vatican, but it was sound advice based on impeccable data. Anyone interested in the health of nulliparous women should take it seriously. In fact, could we go a step further? Could the use of, of ovarian hormones ever become like statins? Ovarian hormones do not require any prior diagnosis or monitoring. A steroid combination preventing bad things happening later in life could be sold over the counter. Already a remarkable 1.5 million women in America 
take pills for their non-contraceptive benefits. 1,500 years ago, St. Augustine asserted that original sin had been physically transmitted in the semen, like some latter-day virus, ever since Adam and Eve first had sex. It followed that the only justification for something as intrinsically sinful as sexual intercourse was to conceive a child. It was a calamitous misinterpretation of human sexuality. John Rock, who conducted the first clinical trials on the newly invented oral contraceptives in the 1950s, went to mass every day before his clinical work. His book, The Time Has Come, argued that oral contraceptives imitate nature and should be acceptable to the church. A commission set up by the Pope agreed, but Pope Paul rejected their advice and his 1968 encyclical Humanae Vitae reiterated every marriage act must be open to the transmission of life. It was pure Augustine, the polar opposite of the biological insights we have that we Homo sapiens use sex both to reproduce and to express love. Our larynx was evolved to vocalize and to swallow food safely. It's as nonsensical to insist that every act of sex must be open to the transmission of life as it would be to insist that Pavarotti should have eaten spaghetti every time he sang an aria. <laughs> Yet it's not just Western criticism Christendom, where men resist giving women the freedom they deserve. Compare the history of Viagra and OCs. The first attempt to register OCs in Japan in the 70s was refused on the ground that Japanese and Caucasian women are different. In the 1980s, OCs were rejected because they might encourage the spread of AIDS. In the 1990s, it was suggested that artificial steroids would enter the sewage and feminize Japanese fish. Viagra was approved in six months. Japanese and Caucasian men were deemed to be similar physiologically. Viagra, it seemed, would not encourage the spread of AIDS, and no one worried about sexually excited fish in Japanese rivers. Embarrassed by their own biases, and 40 years after the first request, oral contraceptives were finally approved in Japan, literally on the coattails of Viagra. A recent study from the Guttmacher Institute found that the majority of women recognized that ready access to contraception changed their lives. Family planning is listening to what women want, not telling them what to do. It is enabling individuals to choose among a wide range of contraceptive methods made available through different channels of distribution. In Thailand, Colombia, and other countries, community volunteers were trained to distribute pills and condoms to their neighbors. Everywhere, it is the poorest and most vulnerable women who suffer most when contraception is not available. In America, women in poverty have the least access to family planning and most unintended pregnancies. Everywhere, family planning is over-medicalized. Misinformation and unjustified barriers often stand between women and the family planning they deserve. In Africa, a woman may walk half a day to a clinic only to be refused contraception because she's not menstruating. There's no scientific basis for such a rule. Ideology and religion can make even the best leaders hesitate to change policies that other people still view as controversial. Pilot studies in Ethiopia demonstrate that village volunteers can dispense injectable contraceptives safely, and frontline health workers can make medical abortion available, but these advances still need to be brought to scale. Consider these facts. In 1912, a 28-year-old woman in New York with three children died from septicemia after a second self-induced abortion. She was Sadie Sachs, and the nurse caring for her was Margaret Sanger. Neither Sadie nor Margaret knew any method of contraception. As a result of lack of contraceptives, 
and unjustified barriers to family planning, surveys demonstrate that 220 million women in developing countries have what is defined as an unmet need for family planning. That is, they wish to end childbearing or not have another child in the next two years, but they're not using a contraceptive. A century ago, after Margaret Sanger, we still have 220 million women like Margaret and like Sadie Sachs who don't have the information on the methods and or the methods they need to separate sex from pregnancy. In sub-Saharan Africa, more women have an unmet need for contraception than are using modern methods. This year in Africa, six million women will resort to unsafe abortions and 26,000, like Mrs. Sachs, will die. As an embryologist and an obstetrician who's performed abortions, I understand and respect a diversity of opinion about abortion. However, we need to recognize that worldwide, on average, and I emphasize on average, every woman now alive will have one induced abortion. In the US, one in three women has an induced abortion. The gap between the mortality and morbidity between safe and unsafe abortion is the widest of any of the numerous inequities in global public health. Instead of an informed debate on a serious issue, we have an increasingly polarized confrontation between patriarchal, scientifically illiterate zealots and those of us who wish to offer women the best clinical care. Indeed, it's a violent battle. In the US, abortion has become the first operation in history where the surgeon is more likely to be murdered than the woman is to die from the procedure. That may be startling, but it's a true statistic. There are no absolutes in embryology. Some fertilized eggs give rise to molar pregnancies with no ethical or legal status. Abnormalities in early development are common. North Dakota plans to make abortion for genetic def defects illegal. Some states in the US, some developing countries, and some of our guests outside this hall are attempting to define a fertilized egg as a person. Billy Jones is a person, obviously a much-loved baby, but he was an ectopic pregnancy who went undiagnosed. He was that astronomically rare ectopic who survived. Here's Billy's MRI before delivery. All of us that are obstetricians would be sued if we failed to operate on an ectopic pregnancy. But initiatives such as that in Mississippi, close by us here, defining a fertilized egg as a person imply that treating an ectopic pregnancy would be legally murder. I was at the 1988 FIGO meeting in Rio, Brazil, when Roussel Uclaf launched Mifepristone, but then withdrew it from the market on the same day. Back in France, the Minister of Health ordered Roussel to put RU486 back on the market, calling it the moral property of women. That was a quarter of a century ago. In India, medical abortion is becoming widely available. I like the brand name Plan C. But in the US, it's still more difficult for a young woman to get a medical abortion than it is for an old man to cure his erectile dysfunction. Over 26,000 adverse events and 2,100 deaths related to Viagra and similar drugs have been reported to the FDA. The number of men with erectile dysfunction is uncertain. Not all the deaths may be drug-related. Voluntary reporting of adverse events is uneven. What is certain is that deaths related to exciting erections in men are an order of magnitude more frequent than deaths due to any form of birth control or medical abortion. I suggest that it's deep-seated Stone Age biases that still influence how we report adverse events and set policies related to human reproduction. If more and more restrictions are placed on access to safe abortion, 
then women will find ways of obtaining mesoprostol and mefepristone, or mesoprostol by itself, in the black market or in brown envelopes from outside the country. Unfortunately, such solutions invite counterfeit drugs, misinformation, and as always, the exploitation of the poorest, most vulnerable women. A woman cannot begin to play an equal role in society until she can choose when to have children and whom to marry. Yet one in three girls in developing countries are married before age 18. Where the Bixby Center works in northern Nigeria, many girls are married when they're 13 or 14, sometimes to 40-year-old men. In less developed countries as a whole, one in nine girls marry under age 15. Changing cultures is difficult, but not impossible. Working with dedicated Nigerian leaders, we have been able to keep 87% of girls in secondary schools, where previously fewer than 4% got beyond primary education. The names at the bottom are just the villages where this pilot project is taking place. Raising the age of marriage and the first birth is a human rights goal and a demographic imperative. In Nigeria, the cost is about $90 a year. It will cost billions of dollars to bring such initiatives to scale in the least developed regions of the world. But the cost of not taking action will be even greater. Last year, the international community spent almost $2 billion feeding hungry people in Africa, and multiple billions responding to failed states, such as Somalia. Last July, my wife and I were invited to the London Family Planning Summit we were inspired by the commitment of Melinda Gates and the British government and other donors. The goal was set of reducing by 50% the number of women with the unmet need for family planning by 2020. Why only 50%? We need a goal of 100% of the unmet need for family planning. Globally, four out of 10 of all births are unintended. If the world were willing to make the investment to meet the unmet need for family planning, then there would be 57 million fewer births each year and a much greater possibility of a politically stable, ecologically sustainable future. A future that will dominate the lives of our children and our grandchildren. Family planning is an investment, not a cost. In California, the federally funded Family Pact offers family planning to women at 200% of the poverty line or below. In only two years, it saves $2 on every dollar invested. In five years, the return is $5. Globally, the UNFPS estimates that preventing unintended pregnancies would save $11.3 billion a year, twice the cost of making family planning universally available. When family planning is not available and the population continues to expand exponentially, and the proportion of young people to older people gets bigger, then there's more conflict and terrorism. The 9-11 Commission report called a steadily increasing population of young men without any reasonable expectation of sustainable employment a sure prescription for social turbulence. When I first went to Afghanistan in 1970, there were 13 million people. Today, there are over 34 million. Two-thirds are under the age of 25. Taliban means student. By 2050, there'll be 76 million people, and 12 million of those will be volatile, angry young men with no education and no opportunity for employment. They're likely to continue to destabilize the country and to pose a threat far beyond its borders. Afghanistan's neighbor, the Islamic Republic of Iran, has had the most rapid fertility decline in history, the Green Line. More rapid than China, the Red Line. In the 1970s, economists in Iran saw that despite its oil wealth, it was not going to be able to educate and employ its exploding population of young people. All methods of family planning were made available, and the birth rate plummeted even in remote villages. Iran has a bellicose president, but because of falling birth rates and better education for girls, there are now more women in Iranian universities than men. In a generation's time, Iran will likely to be a stable country. 
while I fear Afghanistan will continue to spiral downwards. When it comes to fighting terrorism, I suggest the pill is mightier than the sword. <laughs> Consider these facts. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were 1.6 billion people in the world. By 2050, there'll be 1.7 billion people in India alone. In 1900, there were 26,500 more births each day. In 1950, there'll be 2.6 billion people and 100,000 births more each day. Today, there are 7.1 billion people in the world and every day, there are 230,000 more births than deaths. The population of New Orleans is 334,000. In 2050, the UN projects the population of the planet will be somewhere between 8 and 10 billion. Except for some oil-rich states, no country where women average five or more children has ever lifted its population out of poverty. Developing countries need two million more teachers each year just to hold class size constant. Some demographers carelessly assert that everyone will have two children by the end of the 21st century and will all live happily ever, ever, ever after. But unless we invest in family planning, this will not happen. Whether we take the UN projection for the remainder of the century, for the, the highest projection or the lowest, the largest single group of people on this planet will be the people in the least developed countries. The present terrible gap between the haves and haves nots will get wider. Let me end by looking at one part of sub-Saharan Africa where a failure to focus on family planning is leading to disaster. The Sahel comprises one million square miles of semi-arid land bordering the Sahara. It's characterized by poverty, illiteracy, weak infrastructure, failed states, widespread conflict, and an abysmal status of women. Trees are cut twice as fast as they grow. Early marriage to older men is common. There's fighting in Darfur, and Al-Qaeda clones threaten half of Mali. Northern consumption is driving global warming, but the worst impact will be in the south. By 2050, the Sahel, already a pretty hot place, could see a temperature rise of 7 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. The Sahel has the most rapid population growth in the world. We evolved in a world of small clans of a few hundred people. Our Stone Age brains find it difficult to keep a sense of scale when we think of a million people, let alone hundreds of millions. So let me take a small step and try to make bar charts to which we've become immune, physical realities. This on the scale I've chosen is the population of the Sahel in 1950, 30 million people. This is the population today, over 100 million people. This is the population projected for 2050. And this projection is quite a robust one because two thirds of the people here are under the age of 25. They are the mothers of the children that are going to make up this population growth. These women are having six to seven uh, children. In Niger, they have 7.6 children on average. And this extraordinary climb in 100 years is going to take place just as the temperature withers the crops and kills the livestock. We're going to have the largest involuntary migration in history as these people move south. We're going to have more conflict. We will have a rise in infant mortality. As the president said, I was one of the first people working in Africa on AIDS prevention. AIDS has killed 30 million people. 
this catastrophe, unless we take action, I think will be even greater, bring more misery to the world. And yet we know what to do. We need to make family planning universally available as quickly as possible in all these countries. We need to work to raise the age of marriage and to get as many girls as possible educated. And we need to use technology to help people adapt to climate change, although that ad adaptation will end. The United Airlines would not permit me to bring the population projection for the end of the century because it wouldn't fit. <laughs> and that population projection is totally implausible and we will have a huge amount of, of suffering. But we know what to do and we must take action and we as physicians do have a lot of power in the world. We can talk to members of Congress, we can make a, a difference. The welfare and happiness of individual families and our survival as a species depends upon our political, social and technical ability to return to the biological norm where parents once again see two children or fewer live to reproduce in the next generation. Access to health and fertility regulation is a basic human right and the simplest way to exercise this right is to ensure that all women and men have the information and technology so readily available that they can make their own informed, easy to implement choice about if and when to have a child. Choosing family planning is a private issue. It is our choice whether to separate sex from childbearing and no one can take that choice from us. Coercive family planning is as objectionable as coercive pregnancy. Ideology and religion have no place in the bedroom. Bedrooms are for loving, consensual sex.